The scars may be starting to fade, but two months on, the trauma hasn't. Gary Perkins set upon by as many as 20 youths armed with wooden stakes. The brutal attack lasted 45 minutes, all in the front yard of his Maryland home. One of them threw one of the stakes like a javelin and it hit me in the side of the head. And one boy hit me over the head with a metal pipe. And then it's a bit confusing after that. And in the end it just escalated and I think if the police came even just a minute later, mm. Dad wouldn't be here today. The father of two suffered brain damage. He also lost some of his hearing and has post-traumatic stress. I spent nearly two months in institutions like the hospital and rehab and the brain injury centre recovering. And I missed out on that time with my family. He's a lot better than what he was, but he's still not the same old dad, but he will get there. I yeah. know he will. Mm -hmm. It's also been tough financially. The family had to relocate for its safety, while Mr Perkins can't drive and he's off work for two years. But there's been no shortage of support. The Football Referees Association, which Gary was the president of, is organising a fundraiser for Saturday. Basically, we just wanted to give back to Gary, he's, he's one of our own and, and he'd do the same for any of us. You just feel better about society because for every one bad person there's a hundred good people. Details for the fundraiser are on NBN's website. Lauren Bladwell, NBN News. As much as they'd like to, these kids won't have much of a say. Don't close our centre. The sale of their Newcastle council-owned childcare centre not signed off, but on the table. Absolutely shocked. Uh, we've not had any official confirmation of anything from the council. I was actually in tears on Thursday and the staff had to look after me. Glendore at Maryland is one of eight community-run not-for-profit centres that could be sold to private operators. It'll raise the fees <laughs> of all of the um, childcare centres around town. So, I mean, if, if they're too expensive, then I'd have to consider staying at home. Privatised facility has a, a, an attitude of profit and, uh, and that means that costs go up for parents and that's what I'm fearful about. Newcastle Council says the sell-off might be necessary to save $2 million. We're going to do a further analysis of all those childcare centres and look at all the options that may be before Council. One of the reasons why Council is under a lot of financial stress is that we do a lot of things that we do not have to do and that the private sector should actually be taken care of. But current providers are upset they weren't told about the idea. I think we need to talk. I'm not at all surprised that that would be the reaction. And I must say, and I'd like to give some reassurance to the people. Council says it'll have a clearer picture of what it intends to do within two months. Nat Wallace, NBN News. Time to slip into the future. Today, many saw for the first time a breakthrough in cancer treatment training. This is going to change everyone's life here at the University of Newcastle. This 3D modelling of a radiation treatment facility is an Australian first. It gives our students a chance to be a cut above the rest. I think we can see the impact immediately for our over 160 radiation therapy students who from day one will be able to interact with the clinical environment. From the ground up, this place is eerily real. The sounds recorded off the real thing. In fact, we will probably even get students to have to wear their uniforms, their clinical uniforms in here, so it, it imitates that setting as much as possible. The controls, however, are a little different. But with a real-life linear accelerator worth $4 million, this is closer than many students have been before. I just think it's, it's wonderful that we can um, provide this type of career teaching that um, is going to see us to be able to provide a world-class service. Nat Wallace, NBN News. From the late 1970s, Lee Morn became a household name among NBN viewers for his down-to-earth presenting style and commentary about all things sport.
Things went awry on one occasion when Lee was accidentally given the wrong story to read about the actor Sir Laurence Olivier. I'm reading away and the girl on the, on the porter prompt realises this is my, my script. So she winds the button. I see the script go out of the screen into the bucket and I'm looking there with seven seconds to go. So a very quick thinker says, silly old bugger must have died. So we, the whole town, the whole studio anyway, I could hear them down Hunter Street. <laughs> the, and it's come back on me. So what, what do you say? You just say, well, you don't get them always right on the night here. But what a good old stick he is, still dancing around. And then I go to the tennis. <laughs> During a weekend sports show, fellow commentator Michael Hill took Lee to task over some of his terminology. On one occasion, Lee was caught napping. But during this report, he was focused like a laser when the local kids literally pushed him too far. They kept the cameras rolling, so I got through my bit, closed off or whatever, turned around, chased this kid and footed him up the rear end, which is no more or no less than he deserved, Paul. I'm not the slightest po apologetic about that. It's nice to get a win at the, you know, only three races deep and um, still, still in this thing. So a uh, great night for us. One last session before the Jets headed to Bathurst and Mother Nature made it one to remember. A first away win in over a year would definitely brighten things up. Change of scenery, change of luck hopefully and um, uh, yeah, let's hope that uh, we can get a result in Bathurst and if that's the case, well, hopefully a lot of other teams take their, their games regional. Francis Jeffers returns from injury and could start alongside Michael Bridges for the first time. Getting back the captaincy is the furthest thing from Job Wheelhouse's mind as he faces another injection in order to play. Obviously I haven't been out there for the past month with the, with the suspension and the foot, so if I get the um, captain's armband, I'll get it. If, if I don't, it's... At the end of the day, the, the team winning is more important. The Reds arrived in Bathurst on Sunday following a 3-2 loss to the Mariners. Despite Newcastle's recent form, Adelaide's coach is talking the Jets up. They've got some good individual players, but they're good as a unit. And, um, you know, they're, they're a little bit below us on the table by about a point, I think, which is, so there's a fair bit at stake. Meanwhile, the Jets are still working on trading Chris Payne to the Gold Coast for Taj Minicon. We're governed by PFA and, and FFA rules and, and obviously agents, so you know there's, there was uh, some talk of that, but right at this moment I don't think anything's concrete. Mitchell Hughes, NBN News.
This year I'll be heading over to America for hopefully the whole six months, do the whole circuit over there, all the Pro Tour events, the Nationals, the Worlds, and I'll be competing in the Junior Pro Division. The look on Laura Whaler's face said it all. Competing in front of her home crowd, the East Maitland girl wasn't expecting to win the 100 or 200, but that doesn't mean she didn't want to. I was disappointed in a way just because you want everything so much and at this stage I want something that's probably not there. Um, I'm racing with speed I don't have and I think I'm, I'm very hungry but I just need to be patient. With Olympic trials in early March, Whaler is still gunning for an individual spot on the Australian team for the London Games. Still got a lot of work to do, uh, you know, my speed's not where it should be. Just with um, my body I'm, I'm trying to fix, you know, a lot of niggles which are holding me back. Pyrene Steinert was initially disappointed with second in the 400. I have to admit I was really wound up all week prior to it. Um, I think maybe just the hype of it all, knowing that lots of friends and family were going to be there. Steinert says there's no shame getting beaten by 17-time national champion Tamsin Manu, even though she's run faster times this season. Looking at the results and my split times during my run, I was actually really, really happy. I, I've come away with it very, very excited, very positive and really itching to race again. Pyrene and her twin sister Sheena will race again this weekend as the pair chase a dream of representing Australia together. Mitchell Hughes, NBN News. Forget backyards and bush tracks. Here, Supercross is in the stadium, and one of the stars was born under the Southern Cross. You've made it massive out here. It has. It's, it's, it's really been a, uh, a blast. A two-time US champion, Chad, has got it all. The bikes, the fans, the semi-trailer. This is kind of our home away from home, um, on wheels actually. A gym, spare parts, home theatre. This is like the ultimate Hollywood trailer, isn't oh, it? Oh, it is. Paid for by this. Last year, he earned $8 million, and this is the first race of the season. What makes these wages possible is the sight, the smell, and the sound. And the people who are addicted to it in this stadium, 50,000 people and watching at home on TV, 30 million. Between heats, there's charity work and endless autographs. Is there any racing to be had today? <laughs> the racing is the easy part. Not always easy. Incredibly, he walked away from this last year. I swear it jumped up and grabbed me. A broken femur actually did cross my mind. And now there's more to worry about. Son Tate already on two wheels, mum in the stands. Now you've got Tate, you ever tell him to slow down a little bit? Uh, he needs to slow down, but there's no stopping him. Do it for Australia, my friend. Oh, for sure, I'll be fine. You do it Aussie stuff, which I never give up. Denim Hitchcock, NBN News. Fourteen trees, 
14 council meetings until the local government elections. Now Newcastle Lord Mayor John Tate is playing a numbers game, seeking support from fellow councillors to let Novocastrians decide the future of the Layman Street figs. Every candidate at the election will obviously have a policy and they'll be able to put that policy forward in relation to the figs at the election. And then the whole community can decide. Pro-felling councillor Aaron Buman thinks not. Probably one of the mayor's dumbest ideas um, I've ever heard um, and it's probably typical of the fence sitter that the Lord Mayor is. He says the issue's gone on long enough. More procrastination, more ratepayers' money down the drain. We are elected to make decisions. If you don't like our decisions, then don't vote for me next time. I think we should put this on for the new council and uh, people will be able to scrutinise and ask questions of every candidate. And every candidate will have to have a view about it, I expect, and uh, the community will decide. Now, that's what should happen. But despite the cost of the fiasco now topping $1.5 million, the Lord Mayor says costs can be minimised if ratepayers know the trees are safe until the election. I'll be contacting the general manager and putting that view to councillors. Uh, I must say I'm not terribly hopeful, but I am uh, believe I'm reflecting what community opinion is saying. People who vote Green, vote Green. People who vote Labor, vote Labor. And anyone with common sense, well, they'll make their own equation. Tyson Cottrell, NBN News. More than just a place to eat, Soul Cafe is a place where friends are made and lives are saved. We're here for the needs of the homeless, uh, highly disadvantaged, um, people with all sorts of backgrounds that are doing it tough. But three months ago, the charity's lease at its Newcastle West location expired, meaning Soul Cafe itself was in need of saving. The house for the homeless, going homeless, um, how better do you experience what it actually feels like? But now it has a new home on the corner of Watt and Hunter Streets, donated by Westpac. We had space, they had a need, um, it, it just came together perfectly. And just like before, the meals keep coming. Around 50 to 60 are served here each day by tireless volunteers, but there's even more on offer. We have other people joining us, um, like Legal Aid come in weekly, Centrelink come in as well. Uh, Dr Milton Sales has set up a doctor's clinic. And the most important part... So many people are so disjointed from society, but when they come here, um, and it comes out of the words of people, we've made friends in Soul Cafe, and that's what's really important. Tyson Cottrell, NBN News. The lyrics may well prove prophetic for Thursday with rain forecast across the Hunter, but that isn't putting a dampener on Australia Day preparations. At Spears Point Park, Ganga Jang will top off a day of festivities, headlining a concert also set to feature 80s icon Mental As Anything. We've got markets all day, a community village, we've got the movie on the big screen at 11, and we've got a dunking tank this year, and that's something different, and at 12.30 we do have an opportunity for people to come along and dunk the mayor. But you can use it throughout the day to dunk your mates, dunk mum and dad. Newcastle's opting for a more low-key affair, offering a classical concert on the harbour. Music on a uh, harbour stage, right on the harbour, on a barge. There'll also be um, a, an ele electric light parade of boats under light. Fireworks will light up Nobby's Headland and Dyke Point from 9pm following a day of entertainment. Lots of activity happening on the water with water ski races. The tall ship, the James Craig, will be in port and, uh, and a whole lot of activity. Um, Newcastle port tours. 
Former America's Cup challengers will also be on show as part of the Maritime Festival activities. Kath Landers, NBN News. When you look out in the audience, you just see all these amazed faces that they're finally seeing this movie again. It's the main thoroughfare to Newcastle Airport and the holiday haven of Nelson Bay, carrying thousands of vehicles daily. With bus stops on either side, local residents are forced to run the gauntlet crossing it. Disaster struck last year when 11-year-old Taylor Cadman was critically injured when she was hit by a car after her school bus stopped on the other side. It's been a terrible thing to happen um, for the family and for Taylor. After the incident, Hunter Valley buses agreed to drop passengers inside the Bayway village, but also admitted that's not possible during peak times because it's too difficult to re-enter northbound traffic. Not at this stage unless there's uh, changes done to the infrastructure out on the roadway. The Bayway village is home to almost a thousand people, many of them elderly, so crossing this busy road, even with the pedestrian refuge, is a frightening task. Now protests from the community have finally paid off, with the state government pledging $250,000 to install a U-turn bay. Certainly within the next year, I'd like to see it within the next few months. I'm very excited to think that with all the hard work that we finally got uh, a result. Kath Landers, NBN News. Yeah, I still hit a lot when I'm coaching and I just thought because it's local I'll just have a game and I can go home and do recovery in the pool after each match and not pull up too sore from driving anywhere. So I just thought I'd have a go like last year. They're travelling all right at the moment, so um, we've got to respect that. But in saying that, we've got to, you know, go out with our guns blazing and uh, have a real go. Far from the bright lights occupied by the Indigenous All-Stars, Maitland's Minda River Warriors have been putting in the hard yards away from the cameras. The New South Wales Aboriginal knockout champions have earned the right to play Queensland's Southern Dingoes, with the winner to be crowned national champions. We're the best team in New South Wales last year, so you know, this year we're carrying on to be the best team in Australia, so it's a massive goal, we're working hard for it and it's a great honour. In a major coup, the Warriors have secured the services of former Knights and Queensland star Robbie O'Davis. I suppose now I don't play Origin anymore, I can say I'm a little bit both sides. <laughs> As part of the build-up, he's been pushing Minda River's troops beyond their limits. If you can play through this lactate, a bit of a pain threshold type thing, you tend to be able to give right through the 80 minutes. So I got them on the sand, just tried to lactate their body as much as I possibly could. The steps up the Merriweather are pretty good for that. Yeah, it was tough on the legs, you know, but I guess, you know, that, that's the kind of stuff we're going to win the games when, when we're hurting. Training's the hard part, playing football's easy. The Minda River side was created in 2001 with the goal of improving the lives of young Indigenous men. Many are now familiar faces in Newcastle Rugby League. Another young kid, Darcy Etridge, he came out of the Melbourne Storm system, moved to this area. Uh, Ryan Walker made his first grade debut for Penrith last year and as we know, Mick Young you know, spent a fair bit of time at the Knights. The core of the side has been together for several years and has formed a special bond. Becoming Australian champions would be the icing on the cake. To have that memories, you know, what Robbie was saying, like, you know, the memories of playing, we can, we can see each other for the rest of our lives and know that, you know, we won that game. Mitchell Hughes, NBN News.
it's not necessarily what you do, it's kind of where you do it, how you do it, um, how you link your tricks together. Um, you can do the hardest tricks, but you also want to be doing them in um, original parts of the bowl where maybe not everyone else is doing tricks. A pothole minefield on a good day, a navigational nightmare on a bad. For eight years, Peter Imbononi has been desperate to see this section of road between Cessnock and Millfield fixed. The state of these roads have just deteriorated to the stage where they need to be repaired, they need to be resurfaced and it needs to be widened. But a job that big needs big dollars. Wollombi Road is jointly funded by local and state governments, but a budgeted $500,000 falls well short of the millions needed for a complete repair and rebuild. A recent $20 million injection promised by the state government to fix three vineyard roads should help. That should free up money to go elsewhere. So, sure, it's labelled as vineyard road money, but in effect that then means that other money is available to be spent elsewhere in the electorate. But even then, there are hurdles. It costs one to two million dollars to rebuild a road. Mr Imbononi isn't concerned where the money comes from, he just wants the road made safe. I will continue to do what I'm doing and I will continue to jump up and down until the state and the federal government put some money behind our roads. Kimberley Hardcastle, NBN News. Three English friends celebrating the end of university. They're in Newcastle for the start of a trip up the coast. What they didn't bank on was the expense. A couple of years ago, a few of our mates came out and got nearly just shot of $3 to the pound. And we're getting 1.4, I think the exchange rate is. So everything is literally twice as expensive now. I thought it would be a bit cheaper, yeah. The, uh, the prices are just crazy compared to actually what I thought it would be and what it is at home. And... Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's def definitely put a dent in the budget. So if we're here for longer, then we'd definitely get a job where we'd have to because we'd run out of money otherwise. 
Some savvy travellers are getting around the increased costs by earning their keep, helping clean the hostel in exchange for free accommodation. I did think it would be cheaper. It was a bit more expensive, but then it was written in Lonely Planet and the Australian Guide, so it wasn't a huge surprise. With international visitors making up 70% of business at the Newcastle Beach Youth Hostel, these could be anxious times. But it seems our harbour city is doing just fine, actually recording a slight increase in numbers on last year. Traditionally we've been on that uh, east coast route, so uh, whereas the, the travellers now may be not staying as long with the, the, you know, the high Australian dollar, they are actually still travelling that, that um, east coast route, maybe not going further afield. Our rates are cheaper than, say, staying in Sydney or Melbourne, and you know, and, and you know, Newcastle's got a lot to offer, really. Kate Haberfield, NBN News. The blaze erupted just before six this morning, rapidly engulfing the single-storey home near Charlestown Square shopping centre. Just seen billows of blue smoke, grey smoke, absolute black smoke, flames 15, 20 foot out of the window of the house. I went out to have a look and there were four fire engines and people everywhere and, you know, fire flames shooting out of the, the end of this part of the house. By the time fire crews arrived, all they could do was contain the blaze and protect surrounding properties. Fire units were everywhere, but uh, I think if anyone was inside, yeah, there would have been nothing anyone could do. They later learned a 71-year-old man, the home's sole occupant, didn't make it out alive. It's not known if he was asleep at the time or if paraphernalia inside the house prevented his escape. Preliminary observations show it to be uh, a house that was occupied by what we classify as somebody who was a hoarder and there's a lot of items in, the, in that house of various nature. The front veranda was just packed with all cardboard and boxes and newspapers. The items also hindered efforts to get inside the home. Very difficult to uh, keep this illness under control so yeah they store a lot of stuff in their house and it's very difficult to make egress and access and, and successfully try and save somebody. He's had a few problems with um, some of the neighbours and he had a few problems, you know. Police say it's too soon to speculate on the fire's cause. At this stage it's still too early to, uh, to determine. Um, we just have to wait for our investigators to undergo their duties. Kath Landers, NBN News. The year was 1971, the single fin ruled the waves, surfing was considered counterculture and billabong, well that was something you swam in. It was also the year Albie Fowlson created Morning of the Earth, a film about surfers on a quest for perfect waves and a simple life. And it struck a chord. It's one of those shows that after you went and saw it you just wanted to Get, throw in your job and go surfing and not worry about anything at all. Oh, it's the start of the whole surfing uh, revolution, you know, where the full, you know, sort of surf around the world and, you know, surfing as an evolution, you know, it's just the whole start of the dream, the dream of surfing. Former pro surfer Matt Hoy was born the year the film was released. So I feel like I'm, I've got a connection already, but oh, the movie's amazing, like the MP footage, the whole movie, I know Albie and a couple of people who made it, so the movie's just amazing, the soundtrack's amazing. That soundtrack is now being celebrated in a show that's faithful to the original score. Aussie music legend Brian Cadd wrote three songs for the soundtrack, which was recently voted in the 100 Greatest Australian Albums of All Time. So uh, we played a very significant role in the thing and a very specified role 
But at the same time, the brief was, there isn't a brief. Just make them talk, you know, say what they were going to say. Back then we discussed, you know, saving the earth and the whales and the, and the surf and the, the enormous impact that civilization has on the, on the earth. We're still talking about it. We're still trying to do something about it. So it's connected a whole series of dots in a circular fashion. I think it's wonderfully apt now, even though it's 40 years old. Morning of the Earth now heads north for a show at the Gold Coast Arts Centre on Saturday. Blake Doyle, NBN News. When Wayne Bennett talks, rugby league fans listen. So we do need the support of the community. We do need them to come to the game. Today, the normally shy super coach put himself in the spotlight. NBN given a sneak peek. We haven't lost a game, so I thought that was one of the reasons I was getting the nice comments. This one-on-one -on -one with former Knights coach Michael Hagan about allowing the members to get to know the new man behind our team and a push for new members. You know, it's pretty much, uh, I guess, leading into the season and making sure the the members get behind the team. A series of ads will hit our screens from next week. The club committed to getting 20,000 members in 2012. It certainly makes a difference having all your home supporters there and, and cheering on and, and giving the other team a bit of a hard time. And it seems most of the players are prepared to work hard for the result. And just to double check, you are committed? I am committed. Definitely. It's great to be able to present a six star international event, but when you're in Overcash and you see these kids here, this is our future and these are our children, you know, this is what it's all about, mate. It's unreal. I win to win in the end, I guess, yeah, and no, I feel good. Um, a little bit disappointing with the weather and whatnot, sort of hampered play a little bit for me and Sam and the spectators as well, but in the end, it's always good to have a win.
Many Novocastrians wouldn't have heard of Professor John Forbes, but his research to help eradicate breast cancer could very well go down in the history books. It's for that tireless work he's joined an elite club, awarded a member of the Order of Australia. Well, I'm very pleased about it. I'm very proud of it for our research group and um, the commitment my family's made to all the hard work over such a one long period of time. My colleagues in research and um, uh, it's, I think it's really good for the, for the community. Also recognised one of the Hunter's best known politicians and a tireless advocate for improvements in the shipping industry, Peter Morris. Recognition is a recognition of what one's family support is and what one's community support because without the support of the community you're not able to do anything. From born and bred Australians to our newest citizens, 56 people from 24 countries took the citizenship pledge in Newcastle, including one of the Jets' favourite sons, Ali Abbas, who fled Iraq in 2007. It is luck, it is work hard, but end of the day I make it and look now I um, play for a big club in Australia and uh, achieve something very, very good for my life. Despite the gloomy weather, celebration was the flavour of the day and it doesn't get much more Aussie than beach games, all throwing a snag on the barbie. At Nelson Bay, revellers weren't afraid to show their true colours. Born in the bush and moved up here to live. Yeah, love it. Australia Day. We are Australian and it's a good way to show it. Celebrate in every way that we can. The patriotism just too much for some. On Newcastle Harbour, tugboats were dancing, speedboats racing and flags are waving. Then all eyes were to the sky for a death-defying aerial display. While at Fort Scratchley, it was all about reliving the past and discovering what it means to be Australian. Kate Haberfield, NBN News. Fellow MPs on the same floor as me at Parliament House, so it's always good to get one over him there. On the beat, police patrolling Spears Point Park and other large gatherings keeping watch on crowds. The face of Australia Day um, has changed over recent years and um, we take particular interest in the activities of people and to ensure that everyone respects the rights of others. Extra officers are rostered on into tonight to monitor party spots and residential areas. On the roads, police are also out in force for Operation Safe Return. Certainly alcohol related offences is a key focus for us today, speed related offences. By default, the Australia Day holiday has created a long weekend for many and double demerits apply until midnight Sunday. And the Highway Patrol will be focusing um, on our uh, key areas and high risk areas in an effort to uh, ensure that the road toll is kept down and um, certainly I'd like to see it at zero. And here's a potential trap for motorists, even though most students don't return to school until next week, 40 kilometre speed zones will be in force tomorrow, the gazetted first day of term. 18 months ago, the Keneally Labor government deemed Cessnock Council's planning processes incompetent. The O'Farrell Liberal government now believes otherwise. It's better for our community to have local input into decision making than to have three people from outside make the decisions on behalf of us. The planning minister announced yesterday that from tomorrow, council will again be able to approve major developments.
congratulate Brad Hazard. It was a campaign by the previous member for Cessnock, Kerry Hickey, and the Labor uh, Party that took the powers away from Cessnock. The new member for Cessnock says the Labor installed planning panel should have been reviewed, not scrapped. Everybody recognises that they're getting better and they're heading in the right direction, but the jury's still out on this one. And we have learned something through the experience of having them taken away. Real estate agents NBN spoke to agree the move is premature, saying the planning panel had been processing development applications which had sat there for years. Those people who work in the industry day in, day out, they are not looking forward to Cessna getting their planning powers back. Lauren Bladwell, NBN News. An all too familiar scene this season, the coach frustrated as chances again went begging. There was some improvement there, but um, as I said, we need to get better. Both the Jets and the Reds struggled to find the back of the net. With both desperate for a win, the second half was full of attack and any mistake would prove costly. Van Dyke bagging his sixth in five games. The breakthrough got John Cosmina off his seat and seemingly lifted the plays as well as Adelaide went in search of a second. The Jets look to the bench to change things up. Francis Jeffers joined Job Wilhouse on the park and before too long they provided a lifeline. One point wouldn't do either any favours on the table and this one literally went right down to the wire. The Jets gifted a free kick just outside the box. Newcastle remaining winless away from home. We'll go up to Brisbane, uh, take positives out of the game today and uh, hopefully we can bring three points back. Nat Wallace, NBN News. He's fast becoming a familiar face and this morning most agree Jake Higginbottom was the one to watch this year. It's good to come back to Belmont and play. He started the tournament as the highest ranked amateur. But the Charlestown 18 year old will have to be in fine touch. A local hasn't won here since this guy, Bruce Boyle, 40 years ago. And he was back for another shot. Where'd you go? Oh, shocker. I haven't even added them up yet. <laughs> That's probably as bad as I've gone for. 57 years. There was little room for error with 171 of the best amateurs lining up at Belmont, a quarter of the field from overseas. Germany's Marcus Schneider was looking for a prize double after winning last week's Australian amateur in Melbourne. Who uh, won on the 37th hole. The bloke who ran second in that uh, event, uh, Nisbet, is, is playing in this field as well. Perth's Brady Watt found himself searching for help. Last year's winner was down a stroke after the first two holes. Others, though, got off to a flying start. Chris Smith entered the clubhouse as the best-placed local with a 4-under 68. Nat Wallace, NBN News.
certainly intoxication and disorderly behaviour wasn't a major issue for us yesterday, so we're greatly appreciative for that. When the Brennan family stepped through the doors of Newcastle Museum this morning, the last thing they were expecting was this. Such a surprise, yeah, that's great. Great prize, really nice. Having opened just six months ago, welcoming its 100,000th visitor was not a milestone the museum was expecting to reach so soon. Even when we were looking at the numbers ticking up, we were thinking, well, maybe February, and then all of a sudden it's like January and we're already up to 100,000, so we're a bit excited, but it feels like a party for us. The BHP Sound and Light Show has proven a key factor in achieving that, while its first travelling exhibition, Hatching the Past, has also drawn crowds. My son's very interested in dinosaurs, and he's got plenty of dinosaurs at home, and he, was ve he saw the, the ad in the paper and was very excited to come and watch it. And it seems dinosaurs are taking over the building, featuring in the museum's latest mural, which is almost complete. It's just another touch designed to help link the museum with the community. We're the Newcastle Museum and we make a point of telling Newcastle and Hunter stories and people feel like they belong and we think that's great. Emma Murphy, NBN News. This is our 18th year completed and our total money raised and donated to this organisation now exceeds a million dollars. We hope we never have to go out to uh, see a, uh, a truckie in trouble but just in case we're always there. These young men and women are the newest members of the Australian Defence Force. Paraded in front of their loved ones, today marks the start of their military careers. The group from northern New South Wales is now headed to Canberra to begin studies at the Australian Defence Force Academy. And while it's just the beginning, it's been quite a process just to get this far. We check that they're eligible first of all, and then we go and check their suitability. So it's quite rigorous. So you went to your U session and then if you did pass those tests you went to your assessment day where you had an interview and medical and psychologist interview and then after that you went to your board in Canberra for four days. So we're not just looking for academic skills, we're looking that they're going to be suitable to a military environment and obviously an adult military working environment. Today also marks the start of the biggest commitment of their young lives, some signing up for 14 and a half years. For a while, but I think it'll, I'll think I'll go longer than that. It'll be something that I'll enjoy. Everyone I've spoken to has really enjoyed it. So, Kate Haberfield, NBN News. Oh, I'm starting to run now. Um, I'm still in rehab, so uh, hopefully I'll come back on the second or third trial, so I'm looking forward to it. Ben Kantorowski has endured the most tumultuous season of his young career. He says he's honoured to earn a place in the Australian under-23 squad, but he's heading to the Middle East for the Olympic qualifiers with one goal in mind. Game time, I think we've been in two camps now and haven't had a start, so it's just a matter of trying to get that position in the team and get a proper starting spot. Kantorowski's club coach knows he's in better shape than last time he represented his country. Van Egmond has mapped out an intense training schedule to help the teenager get back to his best. There's a possibility, obviously, for him to play in the NBN league because he had that much time out. He, he needs games, he needs trainings, yeah. uh, and we, we just have to keep working with him. Marco Jesic will miss the trip to Brisbane with Korean defender Bjorn and Jacob Pepper coming back into the squad. Michael Bridges will stay on the bench, while Joe Wheelhouse and Francis Jeffers have been promoted to the starting 11. Van Egmont admits Jeffers needs to start firing if he's going to be in Jets' colours again next season.
he's got himself now in a lot better shape than what he's what he's been in previously. So um, yeah, he's got you know a good opportunity for for nine games to to really show uh, uh, what his wares are. In an ominous sign, the coach believes Brisbane is edging closer to the form that saw it become the A-League champion. Although Central Coast are, you know, leading the comp and they're, they're doing extremely well, you know, Brisbane, uh, I watched the game against Hart and they, you know, they basically tom totally dominated the game. Mitchell Hughes, NBN News. Boys and their toys. A normally serene pond transformed into the stage for a battle royale. The only safety equipment needed for this war, gumboots and glasses. Welcome to Model Warship Battle. Not a true to life recreation of naval uh, events, but we are running true uh, warships that were built uh, for World War I and World War II. Each boat is a labour of love, meticulously handcrafted by these enthusiasts. They have the insignia and the firepower, but unlike the real thing, these battleships aren't built to last. We fire ball bearings into each other and, and create holes so the boats actually sink uh, as they would have. Um, during World War II. And sink they do. The tactics are thrown out the door as soon as these boats hit the arena. Shots fired into the hulls again and again, water spurting out the tiny holes. And what takes up to three months to build takes just seconds to sink. Thankfully, salvage crews are on hand to retrieve the vessels. Then, after a quick touch-up, it's on again. This unique hobby has been around for about 15 years and is attracting a growing following. We've got uh, members who are tradesmen to doctors to lawyers to, you know, just everybody. So the hobby's got a diverse attraction for people, which is great. And it's any wonder, because after the battle scars are healed, it's time for a good old chat and a drink. Kate Haberfield, NBN News.